Hi everyone, my name is Julia Coleman. I'm a PGY5 general surgery resident at University of Colorado in Denver, and I have the privilege of delivering a chalk talk to you today, uh, talking specifically about trauma-induced coagulopathy and TEG. And I also want to say uh, for all of you that are at home or watching this from a hospital that I hope you all are taking care of yourselves and staying grounded in gratitude during this crazy time. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, trauma-induced coagulopathy and specifically how to evaluate coagulation in trauma patients. So typically we uh, have historically looked at coagulation in trauma patients through conventional coagulation assays. And that would consist of PTT and PTINR. And one of the issues with those assays for assessing coagulopathy in trauma patients is they're plasma-based. So it fails to account for any of the cellular component uh, and contribution to hemostatic capacity, which we know is quite significant. And in particular, we know that platelet biology plays a huge part in coagulation and trauma-induced coagulopathy. So um, in response to that, now there's been increasing adoption of viscoelastic hemostatic assays. So viscoelastic hemostatic assays are whole blood assays that actually give us kinetic properties of clot formation. And there are famously two types of viscoelastic hemostatic assays. There's TEG, or thromboelastography, and ROTEM. And ROTEM is a rotational thromboelastography. So both of these work in the same way and give slightly different measurements, but they're measuring the same thing. So TEG and ROTEM only differ in that you put blood into a cup, and there's a pin that's inside that cup, and either the pin or the cup spins. And as it does, blood forms and deposits in the setting of TEG onto that pin, and the pin detects changes in resistance and amplitude, and it gives you a tracing. So this would be a typical tracing that you would get on your TAG output. And there are really four measurements that we care about when we look at TAG. Before I get into that, as a side note, various institutions have different types of TAG that they perform. And the two most common ones that you're going to see are citrated Kalim TAGs and citrated rapid TAGs. And I'll talk briefly about the difference between those. So first, citrated. What does citrated mean? So when we collect blood from patients, we collect them in tubes with preservatives. Because we know that if you collect blood into a tube without any preservatives, it's a matter of minutes or seconds in some patients uh, before a clot actually forms in that tube. So back in the day when we started doing tech research here at Denver Health, which is one of the premier trauma centers that studies trauma-induced coagulopathy, we had 24-7 PRAs and professional research assistants that would grab blood in native tubes and they would have to run to the TEG lab and get there within four minutes before a clot formed so they could actually run the assays. Fortunately for those PRAs and for all of us now, we have preservatives in tubes and citrated is one of the most common ones. Citrate chelates calcium and therefore it prevents clot formation. So that's why it's citrated. And that's important because you have to recalcify or add calcium to blood before you run a TAG assay or any other coagulation assay in which there's citrate. Otherwise, the clot can't form. So you always have to look at TAG tracings. If you ever look at a TAG tracing as a flat line, before you get angina thinking that your patient's completely anticoagulated and not forming clots, make sure that the lab tech added calcium to the tank cup to start the coagulation process. 
And in addition to citrated, it can then be either rapid or kaolin. And that essentially refers to the activators that are added to the tank cup to promote clot formation. Otherwise, it takes a really long time to get an entire tank tracing. And because the goal of these is to be a point of care assay to help direct real time goal based resuscitation, according to TAG, TAG driven, uh, we add activators. You can either add kaolin in the setting of a citrated kaolin tag, and all kaolin is is clay. It's aluminum silicate, and it promotes contact activation because it provides more surface area for a clot to form on. Citrated rapid includes the addition of kaolin and also the addition of tissue factor and causes then a promotion of the extrinsic component of coagulation and a massive thrombin burst, so it really promotes the time to clot formation and shortens it. And so that's important because they give slightly different outputs, which we'll now talk about. When you look at a tag tracing, there's only four measurements that you need to care about and report to when you call your attending or you call your chief. It's four things. First is R or ACT. The second is angle. The third is MA or maximum amplitude. And then the last one is LY30. So first, R or ACT. R refers to reaction time. That's the output from citrated kaolin tag. Or ACT, activated clotting time, which is the output from a citrated rapid tag. R times in minutes, ACTs in seconds. Again, ACT from a citrated rapid tag is very fast. So that is the time to clot formation. The second measurement that you care about is angle, which is the rate of clot propagation. This is an effect of fibrinogen and fibrin. Thirdly, you care about MA, maximum amplitude. This is the maximal clot strength, which is an effect mainly of platelets and is an effect of platelet and fibrin cross-linking and binding. And then lastly, LY30, or fibrinolysis, 30 minutes after MA. And as you can tell, what's really nice about TEG and viscoelastic hemostatic assays is that instead of just having a single number, like PTT or PTINR, you have a really comprehensive description of the kinetics of clot formation. It tells you what to do about it. There's a lot of literature that describes that INR overestimates coagulopathy in surgical and in trauma patients, and therefore it's not really the best tool to use when it was really designed to assess the adequacy of Coumadin dosing, yet now we've translated it into use as diagnosing coagulopathy in trauma patients. It's not Arguably, it's not totally appropriate. What's nice about tags tells you what's wrong and what to do about it. For example, if a patient has a really prolonged R, so a really long time to claw formation before it splits, then you know, since we talked about R is time to claw formation, that there's a problem with the coagulation factors. Think about PTSD back to medical school when you learn about the coagulation cascade and all those coagulation factors. That's what we're talking about for time to clot formation, where it all converges on thrombin and fibrin. So if you have a prolonged R, you have a problem with your clotting factors. So what do you give a patient? You give them factors. You give them FFP. So if they have a prolonged R time or a prolonged ACT, you give them FFP. Secondly, with angle, if you have a patient that has a really diminished angle, so once it splits, it takes a long time for clot propagation, then you know they have an issue with fibrinogen and fibrin. Therefore, you want to give them fibrinogen or fibrin. You can do that in many ways, but classically we do that by giving cryoprecipitate. Now, notably, cryoprecipitate is kind of expensive, so some hospitals instead will give also give FFP for a diminished angle because it does have some fibrinogen in it and it's not as expensive, but it's not as rich of a source of fibrinogen. So in an ideal world, you want to give cryo. That's what our algorithm is. Thirdly, with MA, if you have depressed MA, so they have a normal time of clot formation and angle, but they have a lower maximal amplitude or clot strength, then they have a problem with their platelets. So you give them platelets. And then lastly, we get to LY30. And this is the area of controversy, the fun thing to talk about. And um, there's a different approach to this depending on the institution that you're at. So LY30, again, is fibrinolysis 30 minutes after maximal clot strain. You can have, we know there are three different types of fibrinolysis, and these have been um, described phenotypically at our institution several years ago. You can have, this is 
harder to read, switch colors. Physiologic fibrinolysis. Uh, <laughs> physiologic fibrinolysis, which is the normal amount of clot formation and breakdown that happens all the time in your blood vessels to maintain vascular patency. This is in the minority of trauma patients. Most trauma patients, around 80%, present with a pathologic phenotype fibrinolysis, and that can be in one of two forms. One is you can have hyperfibrinolysis. So these are patients who present in the trauma bay and they have extremely prodigiously accelerated clot breakdown. And no matter what you do, you give them all the product you can and they just hemorrhage to death. And they get hundreds of units of blood and they keep bleeding. That's the, the classic phenotype of hyperfibrinolysis. So those patients have what we call classically, we describe as death diamond, where they have a diamond formation and they're take tracing, and that has nearly 100% mortality. Uh, it definitely does if it persists on serial take. And then the other possibility is that you can have something called fibrinolytic shutdown. Now, this is an area of controversy. Um, and there's a lot that's still unknown about fibrinolytic shutdown. But what we do know is it's when you have an initial thrombin burst, fibrin burst, and then there's complete exhaustion of the system. And so there's complete cessation of clot breakdown. So it's the opposite of hyperfibrinolysis and that you have complete cessation of your clot breakdown. Patients who have hyperfibrinolysis die from hemorrhage. Patients with fibrinolytic shutdown tend to develop thrombotic morbidity, and those are the patients, this is our early mortality, the hyperfibrinolysis, but the fibrinolytic shutdown patients are late mortality. Those are our patients that are in the ICU, they die of multi-organ failure, acute lung injury, ARDS, et cetera, et cetera, from systemic microthrombi due to their pathologic hypercoagulability. So the question is, what do we do about these pathologic fibrinolytic phenotypes? So for hyperfibrinolysis, it's accelerated clot breakdown, so you want to give something that stops clot breaking down, in which case that would be tranexamic acid or TXA. There's some controversy around giving that drug, and I'd refer you to uh, read the extensive trials that have been uh, done looking at TXA, both in civilian and uh, combat trauma patients, um, but that is one option for uh, hyperfibrinolysis. And then the question is, for fibrinolytic shutdown, what's the treatment for that? Right now, we don't know how exactly to treat fibrinolytic shutdown. What we hope is that we can resuscitate patients adequately and um, potentially uh, do directed chemoprophylaxis to try to mitigate the thrombotic morbidity. Some may say, well, why don't you treat them with TPA? Well, we've done some research into further categorize the phenotype of fibrinolytic shutdown, and we found that indeed there are some patients that are TPA sensitive. You put TPA into a TED cup, and they readily break down clots. Presumably those patients are TPA deplete. But there are some patients in fibrinolytic shutdown that you give TPA to them, and it doesn't do anything. You put TPA, a very strong clot buster, at a high dose into their TED cup with their blood, doesn't break down the clot at all. And those patients are so intriguing, and we're trying to figure out what's going on with those patients. Whether there's proteins that are released systemically, like actin and myosin, that actually mask plasminogen binding sites, or somehow change the fibrin architecture, but we don't totally know. Um, so it's an area of intrigue in our research. So that is my brief talk about TAG and trauma-induced coagulopathy. And I want to emphasize that, again, if this is a tool you have at your hospital, that I really encourage you to look at your TAG tracings in addition to those four measurements we talked about. Because the numbers sometimes can be deceiving. So if there's a way the software or your computer to look at the tracings, that's so important. And I'll give you one example as a closer. For You can look at a claw on a TAG tracing, and you may see that they have an LY30 of 80%. Now, depending on which hospital you're at, you should calibrate your own normative values and baseline values based on your institutional baseline of patients. However, you know, a normal LY30, depending on the literature you look at, is less than 3 or less than 7.7. 7. 
And so let's say you have a patient with 80% OI30, and you start freaking out. You see that number, and you think, oh my gosh, we got to get them TXA. They must be, you know, circling the sink. But then you look at their take trace, and you see it splits okay. And then all of a sudden, the take tracing looks like this, and it bottlenecks out. What you're looking at is the clot has spun off of the take pin. So you're getting a false reading of what your LY30 is, because it's reading an LY30 at a spot that's not totally accurate. So that is the closing caveat to this, is make sure that you look at your take tracings in addition to the four values that we talked about. And I hope that uh, this was helpful for you. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and direct any questions to me through that mechanism. My um, handle is Julia Coleman, MD. Thank you for your attention.